Thank you for joining us for today's CEO Forum, where we are welcoming business owners and leadership from our region that support the work of this program. The CEO Forum is one of three lines of service supporting CEOs through CEO Next Business Institute. In addition to today's presentation, CEOs, CEOs are supported through peer-to-peer -peer learning and individualized research for their businesses. We have a packed agenda today and anticipate a slightly longer session than usual as we are celebrating the CEOs that have dedicated their time and their energy to growing their businesses in our region through participation in CEO Next Business Institute. We will also be hearing today from a panel of CEOs that will share their lessons learned on growing and selling their businesses. We will be welcoming Jeff Wright, who brings more than 35 years of entrepreneurial manage management experience to his work advising company owners as an investment banker, most recently through Corporate Finance Associates. Christian Johnson is the founder of Spy House Co Coffee Roasters in Minneapolis, with a total of six cafes and a wholesale roasting operation that serves restaurants, cafes, grocery, and e-commerce. Tom Nardini is a second generation owner of Nardini Fire Equipment Company, which was established in May 1949 by his father, Ralph Nardini Jr. Since purchasing the businesses in 2000, the company has grown into a hundred plus employee fire protection contractor with two offices in Minnesota and two offices in North Dakota. Dominic Nordini, his son, who is, um, we were, was scheduled to join us today is not able to attend. He is a third generation family member and the current chief operating office, off, officer at Nardini Fire. Dominic is an integral part of the Nardini business story. So we will be talking about his role in the business today as part of the panel. A great big thank you um, to the panelists for coming today. Um, I just want to note that additional resources are cont contributed to this program through our community partners, Fredrickson and Byron and Insperity. I just want to take a moment now to um, I invite Brent Johnson from Insperity to introduce himself. Courtney's not able to join us today like usual. Uh, Brent, if you could just um, turn on your camera and quickly introduce yourself and um, share uh, what Insperity uh, brings to the table. Yeah, thank you so much for having me this, this uh, afternoon. I appreciate it. I hope everybody's having a great day. Um, my name is Brent Johnson. I'm with Insperity and we help small and medium-sized businesses streamline their people strategy. So what does that mean? It's outsourced HR benefits and payroll. The, the burdens that it, is, that it takes for employers to hire and grow their business, we understand are non-revenue generating. And oftentimes HR is looked at as an expense. We help companies look at it as an investment in a different way to invest in their employees and grow their business. So we work with companies that are solopreneurs looking to add their very first employee all the way up to companies of 500 and more. We help with their Fortune 500 benefits package, streamlining their payroll practices and their payroll taxes, and ultimately that people strategy. So. We work with people that have a growth mindset, a getting better agenda, and realize that their most important asset is their people to continue to move forward. So again, Brent Johnson with Insperity, um, and thank you guys and have a great day. Thank you so much, Brent. CEO Next is a regional partnership funded by Hennepin, Carver, Dakota, Ramsey, and Scott counties. Today, we are joined by representatives from our regional partners, and we'd like to take a moment to recognize their continued and long-term investment in this great resource. Today, whoops, from uh, Carver County, we are joined by Commissioner Sarah Carlson and um, the staff content at Carver County um, is Elise Durbin. So uh, Sarah, if Com Commissioner Carlson, if you are here and Elise, if you'd like to just flash your um, cameras and wave uh, and just so people get a sense of who you are, that would be terrific. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, additionally, we're joined by Lisa Elfson from Dakota County and we're, we have a picture of their, their board here today. So Lisa, I see you're, you've got your camera on. If, if, you have, if you're from Dakota County or you know a business in Dakota County, Lisa is a great point of contact. And um, next we have um, Rick Howden from Ramsey County. Rick, if you'd uh, be able to show your, um, your face, that would be great and wave, there's Rick. And Rick is our contact for Ramsey County. Um, and then today we are, we are, as part of our partnership, we are also um, uh, supported through Scott County and we weren't able to have a representative join today. 
We thank each of our regional partners for this, their contributions to supporting this, uh, to supporting second stage businesses through CEO Next Business Institute. As I noted, Hennepin County is also a funding partner and we kind of coordinate all of the partners in the region. So um, any, you can always direct questions to me. Um, but it is also my great pleasure today to introduce Commissioner uh, Chris Latondras, the chair of the Hennepin County Housing and Redevelopment Authority, which authorizes support for the suite of business support program at, programming at Hennepin County. Commissioner Latondras has been a champion of small business support efforts through the pandemic, and we are honored that he is able to join us today to celebrate the accomplishments and the contributions of CEOs that are participating in this program. Welcome, Commissioner Latondras. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, and the honor truly is, uh, is all mine. Um, so good afternoon. My name's Chris Latondras. I'm the Hennepin County Commissioner representing District 6. And I also chair our Housing and Redevelopment Authority, which sponsors CEO Next in partnership with our friends at Ramsey, Scott, Dakota, and County, uh, Carver Counties. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today and to take some time to acknowledge your contributions to our communities and your participation in the CEO Next Business Institute. Uh, so first on behalf of Hennepin County, thank you for your commitment to this region. Uh, businesses like yours are a big part of the re reason our region is such a wonderful place to live, work and do business. You're integral to our economic vitality and you help keep the fabric of our community strong. And I think never has that been truer than today. Uh, there's no question that the events of this past year, 18 months, have brought immense challenges. And we don't yet know what the road ahead holds, but we do know that all of us have a role to play in our region's recovery. Businesses like yours were the backbone of our economy before the pandemic, and ensuring you come out even stronger will be essential to building back better on the other side. At Hennepin County, we're committed to making sure you have the access to the tools and the resources you need. Second stage companies like yours account for more than a third of the jobs in our region, and that's compared to just 21% for Fortune 500 companies. So your resilience really helps our communities become better places. Your success is ultimately all of our success. And that's why we're investing in new tools and initiatives to help businesses like yours continue to thrive. Uh, while also helping even smaller businesses with uh, capacity for growth to get to your level. CEO Next is one of our lar longest running business support programs. Uh, some of you may know uh, before it was uh, CEO Next, it was called Economic Gardening, which has been uh, running since 2012. And since then, this program has worked with nearly 100 businesses that helped create or retain over 2,000 jobs in Hennepin County. So I'm so grateful for your participation in this program and um, your commitment to growing your business in our region. And I, I hope you found your experience here valuable and that you'll recommend CEO Next to other business owners that might benefit. So as we continue to build a better future together, know that Hennepin County is here for you. I hope you'll continue to stay in touch and share your successes, your challenges, and offer some input on how we can continue to meet your needs and the needs of our business community, both through to the other side of the current crisis and long into the future. Uh, thank you again for your contributions over the last year, and thank you for all the hard work you put into growing your businesses here. And finally, uh, welcome to this final CEO Next Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Latandras, and thank all of you for joining us today and participating in this program. We will have time for questions at the end of this presentation. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. We will also have a recording of this presentation available to attendees. I just want to note before I turn it over to our panelists today that we are currently re recruiting CEOs to participate in CEO Next Business Institute for the 21-22 uh, year. Uh, please refer any CEOs to me or any of the county representatives that joined us today. We will be hosting informational sessions with the SBA Emerging Leaders Program in September and October, and I will put information about those sessions in the chat box. If you have questions about how to participate in CEO Next, please reach out to me 
uh, via email after that presentation. And with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Steve Quello, our longtime uh, program facilitator. Thank you, Mary. I wanted to, to uh, take this time to speak to a couple of our graduates and, uh, and have them, or recent graduates, and have them talk about the experience in terms of value received and in terms of what, uh, if, if they look at their, their experiences this past year, if they knew then what they, what they know now, how they might communicate that experience to um, a, a potential or prospective member. And so with that, uh, Laura, let me welcome you and I'm gonna get my video up, but if you could share your name, company, business, so we get to know you, give yourself a personal plug, and then maybe some feedback on your experience this past year. Laura? Well, thank you so much for having me and letting me say a couple words. Um, this whole year has been really difficult for uh, being a small, medium-sized business. Having this CEO forum to talk with, even though it was digital, was absolutely amazing. The feedback that I was able to get from peers helped me to be able to grow my company and hire some key individuals over the last three months. But CEO Next isn't just about our CEO group. It's about the wonderful content that we're able to get through all these different professionals that they pair you up with. I was able to sit back and look strategically at my company and who these hires needed to be to help grow our company and especially prepare for the next three years. We were also able to look and have expert advice to do some additional social media, um, figuring out how to do our Google, our Google ads, and all the other things that are required there to pretty much free, uh, just advertise your business and grow it. So that free um, expert advice has been amazing for my company. So the whole process has been great, even though we've had to do it completely different. I think that we're able to get through it and it was a great experience. So thank you all very much. And I'm Bob Brunmeyer, and I am the CEO of One Neck Global. We're a managed services provider based in Edina. We do have employees and joint venture uh, folks all around the world. There's 35 of us. And it's been a thrill to be part of the group. I was excited to be part of it. And I, I like the team, just like the as I listen to the commissioner speak, there's the collaboration with counties. I really like the idea of collaboration with other CEOs. Um, I went to a leadership conference and it's, they talked about how it can be a little only at the top. There's only one CEO by definition in an organization. So who do you talk to? Who's your team to talk to? There's quite a bit of feedback right now. There we go. Thank you, Laura. And so it's, it's been very helpful for me on a couple fronts to have a team of people. Uh, there were seven of us in our CEO group, the round table. And so we got to, I got to share stories with five other, six other CEOs and, and Steve and um, Mary's support. And we had speakers, which were fantastic. So instead of just my knowledge, of course, I, <laughs> as a 25 year company, I thought I knew everything. <laughs> what else is there? And then I listened to other CEOs and they brought good ideas and good um, hard questions too. And have you thought about this? And gave me some critical insights. So I like the idea of a team. And if, if the overriding theme for me is that I've been able to s spread out my team and rather than just being myself, one single CEO, I've now got others that I can speak to. They've given me some great insights. I'm a Packer fan here in Minnesota. So I've been a little, it's a little lonely at times, <laughs> like a CEO, but you know what? I, I watched with Aaron Rodgers and the whole craziness going on with there. And I, my biggest question with that is how is the team going to work? And cause team is so important. We all have to get along. We have to hit you. You have to have some insights from other, uh, those CEOs that, uh, that I've gotten to know through the last year. And I, so I think that the teamwork is, has been very important for me. Um, that just having a team of people to give me good insights has been has been fantastic. And Steve and his team have brought fabulous speakers to us, and they've told their stories, which I've been able to bring directly into my organization. So it's been very helpful. Real life stories, real life challenges, and I, I appreciate the team. So that's been it's been a huge plus for me. 
All right, Bob, thank you for your comments and your contribution. With that, Mary, let's uh, move on to our uh, presentation for uh, this afternoon. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Uh, this is Jeff Wright, Principal and uh, Managing Director at Corporate Finance Associates in Minneapolis. Um, I've, uh, I, I'm looking forward to face-to-face -face meetings again, and I, I've been privileged to have been involved as a panelist or speaker with uh, CEO Next for what, Steve, uh, maybe six years. Uh, and so I've met a lot of business owners through this program and uh, I'm, I'm honored to be involved with it. It's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great service uh, that, uh, that, that you and the team do. Uh, next. So we're an investment bank, uh, middle market, uh, $5 million to $100 million revenue companies. We've got offices all over the country and uh, actually the world, um, very deeply resourced and uh, FINRA licensed, which we think is important. We can do securities deals just like the big Wall Street firms can. And there's a lot, a lot of high level compliance and expertise that goes along with that. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little context. Hopefully it's not too much of a commercial. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the Minneapolis office, we've got three partners who, who work on that work with entrepreneurs and family businesses, and we only work with private company owners. Um, all of us, and it's become a requirement, any partner in our office has to have owned, run, and exited from their own company. So we're, we're a bunch of old guys that uh, work with owners who haven't been through it before and help uh, guide them uh, uh, to their successful exit. Uh, and we do the work ourselves. We don't have a team of newly minted MBAs where uh, we, we, we like the hands-on work and, uh, and working with owners. Uh, it's really gratifying work. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna break it down into two phases, preparation um, to, to get your business ready to sell. And then once you make a decision to sell, the process of selling. Uh, next slide. Uh, next is fine, go ahead. Uh, well, I did want, yeah, I wanna say one thing about preparation. Uh, it's not just to get your business ready to sell. Everything that I'm gonna talk about will help you run a better business uh, even if you're not planning to sell for a while. Uh, so it's kind of, a, it's good to do no matter what your what stage of exiting you're, you're thinking of. Uh, first step, uh, strong financials. I really can't emphasize this enough. Must have uh, really good uh, financial reporting, conform to GAAP as, as much as you can, and have a strong CFO or controller on your team, whether it's uh, in-house or outsourced, but having really good people there is a must. Uh, we've been in situations with homegrown businesses where they did not have this, and we've insisted they bring in an interim CFO or controller, and we, we've got resources, and we've done that for many of our clients, but uh, there's just no shortcut to, to good financials. And sophisticated buyers are going to look for very granular information, uh, you know, margin by product, mar margin by customer, slicing and dicing your business a lot of different ways. So um, this is kind of step, you know, step one. Uh, all the points I'm going to talk about are important, but this is a must. Uh, next slide. Uh, building a strong team. I heard a little bit about that earlier today with the uh, testimonials. Um, you have to, if you're going to exit, you have to build a strong team beneath you and delegate and essentially make yourself indis uh, indispensable. Um, I would say that businesses that are defined by their owners are, it's, it's the number one deal killer. It's almost impossible to sell unless you're willing to stay on for many years. So uh, delegation and uh, building a strong team is a must if you wanna exit. Next slide. Uh, core values. Uh, it's surprising how many buyers resonate with this and look for companies who know who they are, that know what they stand for um, and uh, have kind of lived uh, some defined core values. So. Uh, uh, if you haven't done this, it, it, it's, it's a good practice. Next slide. Uh, building a sustainable company, um, you know, it's one thing to be kind of a flash in the pan, but uh, if you build in something sustainable with a competitive advantage, that will be much more likely to be a successful exit than one that, that is kind of drifting around and has uh, occasional spikes in revenue and profitability, but then some lulls, uh, slow, you know, steady, growth uh, based on uh, you know a, a sustainable advantage is much more desirable than wild swings. Um, those are uh, the sophisticated buyers look very askance 
at companies like that that are swinging up and down a lot. So um, build a sustainable company. Next slide. So the process of selling. Um, you're going to hear from some folks who have successfully exited and, uh, you know, this is a, a, a pretty arduous journey, uh, but it can be very satisfying. Uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about may seem a little self-serving, but uh, it's very important. Next slide. Um, and in particular, uh, the advice to hire an M&A advisor, um, first of all, and then hire one based on trust and chemistry. Um, I think category expertise can be overrated. I think that a successful process is what drives a good outcome. And you're gonna be spending a lot of intense time with, with your advisor. And I, I would say that um, you've, most owners it, it ha, who are exiting have never done it before. It's gonna be a first time, last time situation with their baby, the biggest transaction of their life. Um, and uh, I would say going it alone is, is uh, 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 quite scary. Uh, at least build a good team of people who've been through the m and process many times. Um, next slide. Uh, when you go through the process, one thing we found is uh, st to stay open-minded about who might be the best buyer. Uh, we sometimes have clients who think they know who's going to buy them and they tell us, well, I think our biggest competitor, they've been knocking on our door for a while. They're, they're probably the likely buyer, but we find that's often not the case and that buyers who are in adjacent sectors and not direct competitors are much better buyers. They'll pay premium prices. Um, and so we try and get very creative about the, the buyer universe that we bring to the table when we're working uh, with clients. Uh, next slide. Uh, look for a culture fit from your buyer. I, I don't think I've met an owner who didn't care about their legacy, didn't care about their people and the sustainability of it. It's not a cut and run situation. And one of the benefits of bringing multiple buyers to the table, which is what we do, is that our, our clients can pick and choose the, the buyer who's gonna be the, the best culture fit, not necessarily the highest value, although value is also very important. And most likely, the higher value buyers are going to honor your culture and legacy too. So they go hand in hand, but there are some high value buyers who our, our clients reject because they didn't resonate with them at all and didn't think it was a good fit. So um, you can look for a good, good fit and protect your legacy. We think, we think that's part of our, our culture is that we, we, we want to bring the right culture fit buyer to the table for our clients. Next slide. Um, and finally, you know, we run into owners, um, well, I think all owners um, are uh, maybe, well, they're optimistic, entrepreneurs are optimistic, they're can do, and I, I think they tend to under, underlook the risks, they think they have control, but they don't necessarily have as much control as they think they do. Um, many owners are undiversified with too many, uh, too much wealth tied up in their company. Uh, especially older owners who may have a shorter career life runway may not be able to recover from a downturn. Uh, and then owners, as I said, overly optimistic. And, you know, we've been talking about unexpected black swan events uh, that will happen. We don't know when they're going to happen, how they're going to happen, but the black swans do happen and they can be pretty devastating. Uh, next slide. And speaking of black swans, well, we, we had one the last 18 months. Uh, as we talked a little bit earlier today, COVID disrupted everything and changed the rules. And, uh, you know, some, some companies were in better shape than others to, uh, to, to weather this. We kind of put it into three buckets. Uh, the, the companies that got COVID hammered, the companies who've shown resilience, and then some, we actually have a client um, who thrived. And some of this is luck. Uh, one of the companies that was a client, we were in the middle of a process, an IT staffing company, and they had about 50 or 60% of their revenue was with Car Carnival Cruise Lines. Uh, well, they went from you know, busy to zero in you know, a couple of weeks. Um, many of our clients are thriving, or at least resilient and have shown a good upturn. Um, and, and 
buyers are willing to overlook the COVID downturn. So it's not, that dip is not, you're not getting punished for if you're showing a good resilience and a good rebound. And then some that thrived. We have a client who bottles liquids and pivoted to hand sanitizers and made more money in four months than they made in the previous four years. But, you know, it's kind of the luck of the draw. The good news is there's still a tremendous amount of capital chasing acquisitions. Some say it's about $3 trillion. That hasn't changed. Um, if a company is COVID resilient, uh, it's even more of a seller's market right now because there's many companies who weren't resilient and they're not really sellable. And so the inventory of sellable companies is down. Um, and so if you're poised to sell and you're in good shape to sell, this is a really good seller's market. Uh, last slide, next slide, please. So three ways to sell a company. Um, we can talk more about this. I won't get into it too much, too much detail. Do it yourself. Pretty risky unless you have a really, uh, you know, uh, some experience, uh, you, you know, buyers are more sophisticated than most sellers. Uh, business brokers can be a solution for smaller Main Street type businesses. Uh, the model's different that they, business brokers typically price a business, put a tag, price tag like a house uh, on the business. And, you know, that price is not likely to go up, uh, more likely to go down. Uh, it's, it's, it's not on an, on an urgent time frame. Uh, different model. Uh, investment banking is a different model. It's more sophisticated. Uh, it's more based on an auction with a timeline and a process where everybody's at the same stage simultaneously. And I would say for companies that have 5 million annual revenue and up, it can be a good candidate for an investment banking approach as opposed to uh, a business broker approach. Uh, so with that, um, thanks for uh, indulging me. I've enjoyed this. And uh, the next speaker, and I don't know if I'm introducing them or uh, or, or the uh, the uh, CEO uh, next people, but uh, is a is a co former client of mine, uh, Christian Johnson from Spy House Coffee. This this deal closed about three weeks ago, so this is very very fresh, and uh, what Christian went through uh, should be pretty relevant to uh, uh, to the uh, participants today. And Christian, you can um, take it take it over from here. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks Steve and Mary for facilitating, and thank you and for inviting me and for uh, and to Jeff Wright. Um, as Jeff said, um, he was my investment banker through the process, and Jeff and I have known each other for three years, and and Jeff. Could not we could not have done it without his help. He is a very trusted part of our team, uh, very honest, very skilled, and will work for you 24-7. Um, and everything he just said in his presentation is dead on. Um, so yeah, my name is Christian. Um, I'm the founder and owner up until uh, a month ago. And was a CEO and CFO of Spy House. Uh, last month, we turned 21 years. Um, I started Spy House two years after graduating from the University of Minnesota. On opening day, I had $7. That's all the money I had left after building out uh, the first location. And then we grew it to a multi-million dollar uh, business. And then as you know, exited uh, last month. Um, uh, next slide. Um, I guess when it comes to if you want to sell, really ask yourself, are you realistically and honestly motivated to sell? Um, when I decided to sell, it was not for a lack of capital to grow, but just wanting simplicity in life and wanting Spy House to continue to grow with high level professional acumen to take it to the next level. And that's what we found with the group that we sold to. Um, since this, I'm only gonna be doing this for 10 minutes, it seems, I'm gonna kind of fly through it really fast. Uh, there's four sections and it's only about two minutes each. I guess we can do follow-up on Q&A, so I'll apologize for the expediency. Um, if you decide to sell, begin letting go and transition from owner 
to sell her. Know your EBITDA. Uh, EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization on loans. Basically, it's what you make or the business makes plus those addbacks. Um, like Jeff said, I can't agree more. Have three to five years of strong, consistent EBITDA and a run rate that portrays that with well organized financial uh, books, ideally on gap accounting. Um, like Jeff said, are you economically resilient? Um, fortunately, we were um, definitely not in March of last year. We were closed for over a month, but things began to pick back up uh, last summer. And currently we're at 115% of 2019 sales because we're looking at that year for, instead of prior year. Uh, one of our cafes is 140% of 2019 sales. Um, if you have a lot of contracts, have strong contracts if you heavily rely on them. Uh, diversify your revenue. Uh, we do wholesale, cap, our own cafes, uh, licensing, and e-commerce. It's very important to diversify. Um, know the state of your company. Um, we have never had any lawsuits. We've had zero lawsuits in 21 years. Uh, this will be brought up during m and Have uh, strong key members in place um, that can show the company can operate without you. Uh, discretion and confidentiality are really, really important throughout this process. Um, when you're selling, you want to target private equity groups and strategic adjacent buyers, similar businesses to you that align with your values and mission. Um, know your options and what you want. Do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay involved with the company? Do you want to consult? Do you want to be on the board? Do you want to roll over equity? These are all questions that will come up. Uh, next slide. Uh, the advisors. These are very important people in your inner circle that you trust and that become- Maybe perfect. next slide, please. And you want to really surround yourself with smart people, well-versed in financial management, legal and general business advice. It's super, you know, selling your business is a roller coaster ride and super emotional journey. And these advisors, and all of you, I'm sure, have great advisors and you know trusted cohorts throughout your business life cycle. Really surround yourself with those people. Uh, next slide. So the process, be patient. That is difficult for me, <laughs> extremely difficult. Time is definitely not in your side um, because we're so used to being, you know, very nimble and very fast and making decisions. And when you're dealing with going through this process of due diligence, it is a long process and it could take, God, anywhere from four to 12 months. And so just be patient, listen to your advisors, you know, like listening to Jeff from CFA, he has been through this a million times and he was dead on in all of this. You just have, kind of have to go through the process and work on the information that is required and asked of throughout the due diligence process. Uh, quality of earnings, that is a massive process. That's basically a process where they go through 
and evaluate all your financial financials. And it's, it's a long process. So for sure, once again, really have tight, organized financials. Um, and then you'll have the, the transition period uh, with their team. And also kind of backing up, um, really, you know, you want to vet out, you know, the people that you're looking at to purchase your company. It's really important. Um, you know, in addition to the process, what we did working with Jeff is you create what's called a SIM, a confidential information memorandum. And this is basically a book and a historical perspective of your entire business. And once that SIM's created, then you create a one page teaser. And that teaser is sent out to around, in our case, 3,000 private equity groups. And it doesn't list the name of the business, it just lists what category and some general information. And then people respond, and then you sign uh, NDAs, and then you start management meetings with potential buyers that align with your vision, goals, values, etc. Um, uh, next slide. So exiting. You know, you really want to transition yourself from, you know, your prior purpose of devoting yourself to your business to a new purpose that aligns with your goals and your future and uh, well-being. Um, CEO Next sounds like a really fascinating program. I wish that I had, be, had become involved with or had known of. Uh, it sounds like it's a great arena to engage in discourse with your peers. Um, all of us are very fortunate, you know, to own our own businesses. And we've all fulfilled our dreams and hopes. And especially during these super troubling times, Longevity is key for your businesses. Um, just going to read off some stats. 99.9% .9 of all U.S. businesses are small business. It's almost half the workforce. Two-thirds of those businesses survive only two years half at least five years, and one third, 10 years. Uh, this is year 22 for Spy House. And I'm so grateful, especially to all our awesome and loyal customers and to all the advisors, you know, that supported me, you know, through this process. Um, I look forward to everybody's questions and, you know, thank you for joining. And that is it. All right, thank you, Christian. I think um, we're welcoming um, Tom Nardini and I think Steve uh, may add, add to this as well. So Tom, yes. take it away. Hi everybody, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present at this, uh, this event. I first like to thank the uh, participating counties in the uh, CEO Next program. It's been uh, an absolutely fabulous opportunity for me personally and our company to have the, uh, have the ability to spend time with, with uh, the groups in uh, talking about our businesses and learning more about our business our operations and things 
it's been awesome. And I really appreciate the county's efforts for uh, supporting small business. Um, want to thank CEO Next, better known as to me as Economic Gardening. Um, really done a lot of a lot of good things for for uh, me personally and our business. Uh, I want to make a special thank you to Steve Puello. <clears throat> he's been a great business partner, a good friend, and uh, he's a fabulous moderator for the uh, events and the the meetings that I've been involved in. Um, frankly, I just don't think I'd be where I am today without, uh, without his personal guidance. Nardini Fire was founded in 1949 by my dad, Ralph, um, caddying for a guy at the Keller Golf Course, and the guy hired him. He had a chemical business, and uh, part of that business was fire protection. My dad took a liking to it, bought, out, bought him out over the next uh, year or two, and um, took the business up uh, through the process of growth for quite a number of years. Uh, next slide. We have our 72 year anniversary, or excuse me, 73, got to do my addition right. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a long-term small business uh, company that operates pretty much in five states, but we have a national reach or we've had a national reach. Now that we've been acquired, we have a very strong national reach. We've gone from four offices to over 90 uh, with the sale of the business. Uh, Nardini Fire grew, has grown to 110 employees, uh, four offices and two in Minnesota, two in North Dakota. And uh, since that we've made one acquisition and, and we're trying to make some more as we move forward. I've always told people, um, never gonna sell a business. It's gonna stay in the family. My son and my business partner are gonna take over. Well, all of that changed in September. But uh, before that, the, the big thing with, with uh, CEO Next was we learned about traction. We learned about onboarding people, analyzing people, uh, putting people in the right seats. Those are all things I had no clue on how to do. Next was, slide. On this, huh? Uh, next slide. Like that. Don't worry about the slides. Um, <laughs> I, I started working in this business when I was 11. I've lived and breathed fire protection my whole life. And, but my forte was getting my hands dirty learning the business, running the business, but operating the business was, was really a, a tough challenge for me. Um, I'm the quintessential uh, working in the business and never working on the business. Uh, but we had a great name. We had a lot of, we have a great group of employees and employees are absolutely the foundation of your business, no matter how big or small you are. If you don't treat your employees right, you don't make them feel part of your business and make them feel welcomed and loved, whatever word acronym you wanna use, um, you're, you're, you're destined to fail. And Nardini Fire has grown our business over the years because we have great people and we, have, um, we provide a fabulous product. We are not only in the construction business for fire protection, putting fire suppression and fire detection systems and fire extinguishers, alarms, et cetera, for our customers. We're also a very large service company. Fire protection must be maintained at regular intervals as prescribed by insurance and fire code. So we're in a, we're in a somewhat regulated business, but we still have to perform. And it was really hard for me trying to manage the growth, handle sales, and do all of those things. And I got really fortunate to, uh, when my dad retired, uh, we hired a, a really, really good controller who became my friend and, and helped me deal with the parts of our business that I didn't really care for. I mean, 
as important as it is, the financial aspect of your business, I was so busy selling and dealing with customers and things that um, I just didn't have time for all of it. I'd work 10, 12 hours a day and not even when I'm when I, not even being involved as heavily into the financial aspect of our business as I should have been. But I got really lucky. We had a lot of great people. Then about eight years ago, um, I just by happenstance at a St. Paul Chamber of Commerce meeting, got to talk into a gentleman and he put me in touch with a headhunter. And I got to meet this young man who uh, ultimately became my business partner, uh, much younger than I was. But I tell you, we saw things at the same plane all the time. He quickly became our integrator and I was able to pass off a lot of the things that I wasn't as skilled at doing, uh, but he also helped me with things that, uh, that we were trying to do to take the business forward and grow it, grow it uh, to where it was, where it is today. Um, one thing that I did do when my dad retired was I stopped the revolving door. Um, love my dad, very successful businessman, did a great job, but uh, there was a lot of turnover here. And I very quickly learned that it was costing us a lot of money. So we changed a lot of that and, and it really benefited our business. But uh, when Chris Jensen, my business partner uh, came in, uh, we started um, evolving the business. And it was just about the same time that I started learning about traction. So um, I was involved in it with CEO Next and I bought the books and I asked Chris to, to uh, read through that. And we immediately implemented traction into our business. It was the best thing that ever happened. Um, we came highly organized and from top down and it really allowed us to become very nimble, very flexible, but very responsive to our customers' needs and everybody knew where we were going. Um, the other thing that happened uh, uh, about five, six years ago, my son came into the business and he was a numbers guy. He was totally into the computer systems. And so we immediately put him in charge of working with our accounting firm, which is also a very critical thing for your business to have a really good accounting firm who knows you, knows your business, understands you, and has liaisons between the county firm and your business, whether it's your controller or your CFO or whoever it might be, it's, it's really important. But still, I was never gonna sell this business. I was gonna sell it to my, my business partner and my son. And uh, we got to a point here about a year and a half ago or so that that process needed to begin. I'm going to be 65 in a couple of months. And I decided, you know, this isn't going to happen overnight. I better get my butt in gear and start this process for Dominic and Chris to become more, more prominent owners in the business. Um, so I didn't want to go to one of the local companies to get some kind of an idea of what we may or may not be worth in the market. I just didn't want to expose our books, which was my biggest fear. And I talked to a friend of mine in Texas and he said, you need to talk to these guys. It was an equity company. They're buying companies up. Um, just talk to them. They'll give you a ballpark figure. See what you think about it. And at least you'll have some idea what your business is worth. In the meantime, I talked to our accounting firm and they went on this national site and did all of these EBITDA calculations and, and looked at what our kind of biz type of business was selling for. And uh, so we had this idea in our head what we were going to hear from these guys. So I called them. They flew up here, spent a couple hours with us, with Chris and I, not Dominic, because he was not an owner. Chris and I were. And, and uh, we walked out of that meeting going, boy, these guys are awesome, but we're not going to sell. So I asked them what, what, it is, what it is that they needed from us to give us a ballpark figure. They asked for four single pages of financial data. I thought, well, we can give them that. We're not, they, that's not going to hurt us. We gave it to them, and uh, they came back with a number that was about 25% higher 
than what our, our accounting firm told us we would probably expect to get for our business businesses. So they kind of got our attention. So then I talked to Dominic and Chris and I said, well, what are we gonna do here? Well, we don't want you to sell, we wanna buy it, we want. But then we went through the, the process of banking, um, getting the money. And it, it came really down to, I'm gonna have to bank the sale. And I talked with these guys about what the future might bring and what their obligations are and blah, blah, blah. And in the meantime, the, the equity group that bought us invited us down to Atlanta, which is where they're based. And I told Dominic and Chris, you guys are going to go down there. I'm not going. I don't want them doting over me because I own 90% of the company. You guys have to do this. You got to go wide, eyes wide open, come back with two reasons why we should do it, two reasons why we shouldn't. And they came back after a few days and said, well, the main reason why we shouldn't do it is we don't want you to. Can't give you any other reasons. The other reasons are you need, we need to do this or at least take it to the next step and get a formal um, offer. So I called these guys back and said, all right, what do you need for a formal offer? Well, they wanted eight more single pages of documentation and they came back with an offer that was um, another 20% more than where they were with the budget number. So I went back to Chris and Dominic and said, there's something wrong here. Went to, went to our accounting firm and they said, my, our accounting firm said, if you don't sell that company for the number that they're offering you, you're out of your minds because they're above market by a fair amount. So we talked and talked and talked and considered and negotiated back and forth and finally came to terms. And so on, right after Thanksgiving, between Thanksgiving and, and December 1st, we, the three of us, Dominic, Chris and I decided we're gonna sell a business. So I talked to our accounting firm. I said, we're gonna pull the trigger. And then I talked to the buyers and said, we're gonna sell to you, but the only way we'll do it is if we close this deal by December 31st, we're talking 35 days to close this deal and be done with it. Because I didn't want to go into 2021 with the new government coming in and the new regime and what it might do to capital gains and all the rest of it. And uh, since they had looked at the, the, uh, the way that we had managed our uh, computer system with regard to our customers and our, and our accounting, and all of that, because we are so highly organized, thank you, CEO Next, for kicking me in the butt to get that going, because we are so highly organized, they can do it. So my son and my business partner worked on that aspect, the financial aspect of the, the diligence that needed to happen, and the working through things, um, our accounting firm, uh, recommended an M&A company that they had done a lot of deals with. And I felt that, that it was important to us to use that group because they had a good working relationship with our accounting firm. And uh, I, will, I will agree that uh, from what Jeff Wright said, having a good M&A company is absolutely 100% required you would be absolutely kicking yourself if you didn't have a good M&A firm to help take you through this process. It's 100% required. Tom, this is Steve. That's a great segue to, to trying to uh, uh, open up for questions. Yep. Uh, and then also uh, uh, circle back to, to Jeff's topic where he talked about uh, preparing the company for sale and then uh, the, the selling process. So with that, set up uh we can you know delve further into your story tom in the q a yep. so why, yeah why i was done we... anyway okay let's open it up to the group and you're welcome to turn on the video and uh, uh unmute and then uh we have some questions to share uh, and i'll start with one that was in the chat box privately and this is really uh, directed more to jeff uh the 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 difference between uh using a broker versus investment banker um, you know, sort of what is the threshold and then what are some of the charges or rates for those particular services? 
Uh, as I said in my slide, I think that you know five million dollars and maybe a, a million dollars of adjusted EBITDA starts to justify using an investment banking approach. That's that's kind of our threshold, um, and and you know much below that, the buyer universe, the institutional buyer universe, kind of dries up. It isn't as big a universe, and. Uh, you know, the process, the expenses involved with it don't, you know, justify the, the, the closing price generally. Um, investment bankers typically charge some form of a work fee monthly or milestone payment. Uh, that's more to have, have the owners have skin in the game, not the way we make our money. Um, and then we make our money with a success fee, which is generally some kind of a percentage of the, of the closing amount. And that depends, you know, that's negotiated deal by deal. We, there's a market, we all know what it is basically. And we try and be right in the middle of market. So that's not really how to choose an investment banking partner, I would say. One thing we do, and it's actually been a trend lately in the business, we've been doing it for uh, over a decade, um, is have, have the, have the uh, payments have a hurdle rate where if we overperform and get into a, a, a you know kind of uh, extra credit you know higher value, you know it sounds like Tom's maybe although they came to the table first but you know have a threshold where kind of fair market value and above that the percentage increases at the margin so we're all really aligned to drive value as high as possible sort of anti layman formula where we're paid more on the last dollar as opposed to less. Um, so yes. The follow-up to that uh, uh, that was submitted it, it, it is tied to the type of sale, stock versus asset. Do you see a different uh, ratio in the investment banking world versus broker world? Or what, what, how do those two tend to shape up from your perspective? Uh, we've been doing way more stock deals than asset deals. And, and I don't think we're statistically significant, so I wouldn't overdo that. Um, but some there are... Be the traditional thinking is that, you know, sellers want a stock deal and buyers want an asset deal, but that's not necessarily true. There are buyers who benefit from a stock deal, especially if there are a lot of contracts and, and you know, master services agreements that can transfer without uh, having to renegotiate everything, uh, you know, selling the, the, the stock, the entity versus the assets. So there's benefits to that, but either, either form can work. Um, we've done a lot of stock deals where there's a what's called a 338H10 election, which it 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 it, it makes it more like a an asset deal, even though it's technically a stock deal, and that, that gets into some details. But I'd say 60 to 70 percent of our deals were uh, were uh, our stock deals, just because of the nature of the businesses we're in, like IT staffing. We've closed I think five or six of those companies, and stock deals are sort of necessary to maintain all those contracts. Um, in Christian's case, it was originally conceived to be a stock deal. And at the about 11th hour, it was in both parties best interest to convert it to an asset sale because there were some grant money and things that Christian had applied for that he had a right to get, but the, the buyers didn't want to take on the liability uh, of, of that and some other matters. And so we converted it, but both, both uh, methods can work, um, can, can be very viable. Good. All right. Well, we again, encourage people to turn on their video or to unmute and ask the questions directly. Uh, 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 in the mean, oh, there you go, Bob, question. Yes. Uh, this is for Jeff, uh, Jeff, uh, as a managed services provider, we are interested in potentially doing acquisitions. Do you do those? Um, that's one question. And then does it make sense for us? Uh, we've made some investments in software and some other things to build the company, the foundation of the company. Does it make sense to do some roll-ups and then sell? I know that may be a loaded question because you don't really know our business all that well, well just by my question. Well, that's enough to go on. Uh, we really prefer to, do, to represent sellers. We've done a couple buy side uh, uh, deals, but it's not our bread and butter, and it, it's just not. I, 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 I would make exceptions, but generally we are a seller representative. Um, the certainty of close is much much higher than being hired for as a buy side uh, firm, and and companies don't generally want to pay retainers to a firm like ours. 
and we would have to have that if we were doing buy side work. So yeah, we have done it. We've dabbled in it. We've successfully closed, I think, two buy side transactions. But it's not what we prefer. We're really a sell side. Uh, in terms of rolling up, there is a size premium on deals. So uh, if 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 you're I don't know, making this up. If you have two two million dollars of EBITDA and the multiple in your space is six times, and if you're a four million dollar EBITDA company, the multiple might be seven times. Those are just illustrative numbers, not necessarily correct. Actually, your multiples are probably going to be higher since you have a recurring revenue kind of business, and we've sold some recurring revenue businesses, some fast companies. Uh, we can talk offline if you'd like, but that's the rule of thumb. Thanks, Jeff. Great. I have a, a question back for Tom. I know Dominic had planned to join us today and for different reasons couldn't make it, but uh, as the third generation uh, Nardini and someone who was really more financial and uh, uh, operational, uh, if you could talk about what the pressure that, that uh, uh, year-end sale put on the company and how did you manage keeping the ship uh, headed in the right direction and, and not letting the numbers slip while your, your integrator and your operations leader were basically being distracted by this uh, transaction? Well, it's, that's an easy answer, Steve, and I go right back to traction. Uh, we had have an organizational arrangement here that allowed Dominic and Chris to pretty much immerse themselves both into the, the uh, sale of the company because I'm sure everybody figures that there's just a lot of diligence going on, a lot of in-depth uh, responses to questions and information develop, uh, preparation. Uh, our organization allowed them to be away dealing with this. We didn't miss a beat. It was great. We had a great management staff. Um, Nobody, nobody knew this was going on. There was, there was five or six of us that knew this was going on until we announced the sale, which happened on December, the first business day after the first of the year. This deal was done at uh, 11.59 p.m. on December 31st. We had our check at 2.30 in the afternoon on that day, it was a cash deal, no hold back, no earn out. We retained all of our AR. Uh, I mean, it was it was crazy. And we did all this. We did have to bring our, our uh, controller in, obviously, because there were just a lot of financial things. But everything was pretty much managed through our accounting firm and the M&A people. Um, and, and Dominic and Chris, I mean, it... It was a very stealthy, but very detailed 30 day process. It's there, there's people that sat in our uh, sale announcement meeting that thought I was kidding because there's been a couple Christmas parties where I've, I've uh, spoke to the people and haphazardly said, well, I sold the company and they really hadn't. Uh, some of them thought I was kidding around again but um, it took them a few minutes of my, my, my speech to realize it happened. I, I would characterize that as a highly unusual scenario. So yep. uh, I, I would like to pose the same question to Christian in the sense that you had referenced earlier a four to 12 month period, which yeah. I think is more typical. So juxtapose your uh, uh, sale or transaction process with what Tom just described. Well, I mean, I think our process was really three years. You know, we, we I, I originally, at, at, we took it to market three years ago with Jeff. And the short version of this is I didn't really like any of the structures of the deals. So therefore we went to headhunters and, and looked for a president. And then we hired a president um, incidentally, a, a friend of mine who I'd known for 12 years, who is currently the president and to grow the company. And then we took it back to market, uh, last year. 
Um, and I think the reason it took so long for us was because of COVID. Um, because the equity group wanted to see a consistent run rate of EBITDA. And in November, COVID rates were spiking. We're entering into winter. So we kind of got hit twice. So we kind of had to wait until really the March numbers and historically March jumps up about 20, 25% from February because of longer days and it's warmer and busier patio, et cetera. And after March, that's when it started. So April 1st really is when it just went 120 miles an hour. And so, so April, May, June, so it took about, I guess, three and a half months, but we had a lot of work done prior. So it is a long process. So COVID is what pushed it back. So but uh, the reoccurring theme appears to be that having the company process systems accounting function in order allowed for Tom to close in a relatively short period. And, it, and obviously for you, it, it was needed to give them the numbers they needed. But I look back to our audience here. How, how do we uh, uh, learn from this? You know, what advice would you give to the, the people that are maybe are three, four years or more out from even seriously considering selling? What what should we be doing now? What should they be considering now that in hindsight you wished you had done earlier? I'll start with Christian. Here, here's what I would say. I would say that you know, doing this for, you know, on our 22nd year, doing this a long time. And, you know, I have a lot of experience and I've been through a lot. And I think I would say my number one biggest regret overall would be not hiring a COO 10 years ago to start scaling with me on the periphery and looking at an aerial view at the company rather than being in it so much. All of us, everybody listening and watching, we all work 80 hours a week and I'm not complaining. I love it. I didn't sell because I didn't like it. I love my job. There was 25 other reasons why I wanted to sell. So I think really putting yourself in an aerial higher level position day to day to grow your company, let someone handle the day to day operations on the ground. You know, we have all, our financials have always been super tight, um, even though quality of earnings is a long process to go through. But I that would be my biggest advice. Get yourself out of the daily ops. Gotcha. And curiously, that sounds like what Tom did intentionally or inadvertently by hiring Chris, getting the integrator in the traction terminology and then having his son Dominic come in with that uh, tight financial systems mindset, he was in effect doing that. Tom, would you, would you agree or what takeaway would you share in terms of what we, the audience, should be doing at this point with the future in mind? Well, Steve, I, I agree with everything Christian said. Um, you, you taught, you and your, your the, the meetings that we had taught me that you should always run your business as though you're going to sell it. 100%. Every single day, run your business like you're going to sell it tomorrow. I never understood that. Me neither. I understand that now. And right people, right seats. Yes. That's critical. I, I have no business trying to run the financial aspects of this company. I'm a salesman. I'm a people person. That's what I'm good at. And I got lucky and I found a guy that that filled that overall managerial day-to-day -day business operational seat that I never had. I was trying to do all of it for 20 years. Yeah. And 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 uh because we love it. Yep, yeah, because we love it. It's in our blood. And yeah. and uh I just uh, Right people, right seats, and you've got to have somebody at the at the helm that it can that can help you run the business if you're not the guy to do it. Absolutely. Okay. Person Absolutely. To do it. Let, let me share the, the same question uh, for Jeff with the understanding that you've seen many of these deals close, and I'm sure you've seen it, your share that didn't close for different reasons. 
if you look back, what is the thing that, that you have seen people do right or do wrong that made a big difference at sale? Um, at the risk of, re of repeating myself, I, I think having <laughs> both the financial and, and operational act together, you know, we, we do a lot of deals that the, you know, companies that are 30 to $50 million revenue companies, and a lot of them, even though they're, and they've been around 30 to 40 years, a lot of them, um, and they're successful and the systems work for them, but they don't work for a sophisticated buyer. So even though it's a $40 million company, you'd think it would have enterprise level systems and ERP systems and things like that, but it's run back of the envelope, you know, uh, you know, homegrown. And we've had some that just didn't survive due diligence because it just wasn't granular enough or enterprise level enough, even if, even if we've caveated that to the, own, the, the buyer universe. Uh, so that's one thing that, that uh, has blown up some deals. Um, and a, a few deals have blown up due to acts of God that nobody could have predicted or controlled. But uh, we, we have a high percentage of close, but you know, I, you think that a 40 to $50 million revenue business would, would be pretty darn buttoned up. And uh, uh, we just attract, you know, entrepreneurs and founders who have made it work very well for them. But as Tom said, it's not like they're running it to sell it the next day. They're running it, you know, out of a checkbook, you know, in their office. And it's, it's not good enough. Uh, sophisticated buyers just aren't going to be comfortable with that. Yeah. I kind of, I, I would, I kind of, the analogy that I kind of give, I mean, I'm relatively, I guess, pretty young to sell. I, I guess I'm not going to retire, but sell. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, still trying to figure it out. I'm only like three, four weeks into this thing. I'm just figuring it out, but I'm absolutely happy and ecstatic we sold. However, I think a lot of us business owners, you know, we know every square inch of our spaces. We built them from the ground up. You know, we, I've designed all my stores. I know everything about them and we're kind of a, like, I'm a kind of akin to say in the 1910, 1920s, the old guy sweeping out in front of his grocery store, just doing a day in day out. That's what we all are entrepreneurs at heart. And you do have to let go in certain areas to grow your business. I cannot stress enough, get out of the daily ops. All right. Well, thank you all. I know Mary has some closing comments, so uh, appreciate your contribution uh, and and, uh, and congratulate you on your success and your journey. And and so uh, hope you all you know, find what you're looking for. And Mary, if you could close with sort of where we're going next with the program. Yeah, great. Thank you, Steve. And I'll make this quick. I know we're over time. Um, we will be, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, we'll be hosting informational sessions with the SBA Emerging Leaders Program over the next couple of months in September and October. If you know of a CEO that would like to learn more about this program, we'll be, Steve will be there um, to answer questions. Um, I'll be sending information about those sessions to participants on this call. And then we'll be picking up the speaker series again later this fall. So please keep an eye out for emails um, from me announcing the you know, next lineup of speakers. And um, if you know someone that would benefit from participating in the speakers forums, um, we will be happy to put them on the notification list. Uh, so again, thank you all for coming today. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the CEOs and thank you to the leadership that supports these programs or this part, uh, CEO Next Business Institute um, in our region. Have a great day.